Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome from London to this event organized and hosted by the uh, Hellenic Observatory of the London School of Economics. My name is Spiros Economides. I'm the Deputy Director of the Hellenic Observatory, and I'm an Associate Professor in International Relations and European Politics, and I will be hosting uh, and chairing this event. The title of today's event is Greece, Cyprus, and the Crisis in the Eastern Mediterranean. I think you'd all agree that this is a very hot topic, and it's a very timely and contentious topic. Uh, since the early summer of 2020, there's been a deterioration in relations in the region and a constant escalation of crisis, uh, which has manifested itself most dangerously in a standoff between the respective navies of Greece and Turkey uh, in the Aegean. But these arguably are simply symptoms of a crisis and not the cause. And it builds on long-standing political and legal contestation, regional insecurities and instabilities, which have been exacerbated more recently by the discovery of large reserves of hydrocarbons in the region, and the inevitable internal political uh, reasons for the escalation of international crisis, which we've seen over the years. To help us navigate our way through these rather treacherous waters, we have welcomed today a very eminent panel of speakers who will address various dimensions of the topic at hand. First, I'd like to welcome Professor Costa Sifandis. Uh, Costa is a professor of international relations at Pandion University in Athens. Secondly, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Fiona Mullen. Fiona is an alumna of the London School of Economics, and she's a director of Sapienta Economics, an independent economic analysis unit uh, in Cyprus. Uh, James Kerr Lindsay, who's a professor, a visiting professor in the European Institute uh, at the London School of Economics. And we'd also like to welcome Professor Yanis Grigoriadis from Bill Kent University, where he holds the chair of European Studies, the Jean Monnet Chair of European Studies. Unfortunately, right now we have a technical issue, so we hope Yanis will be joining us very, very shortly. Could I please remind you that this event is being recorded and it will be later released as a podcast on the Hellenic Observatory website. And the hashtag for this event is LSE Greece. Our speakers have kindly agreed to limit their remarks to about 12 minutes or so, perhaps 15 minutes. And then we'll have a plenty of time for a Q&A session, uh, which will be available to all participants through the Q&A function. Please do identify yourselves and your affiliation when asking a question. Uh, without further ado, uh, Professor Ifandis. Thank you very much, Pyrrhus, uh, and uh, good evening uh, from, uh, from Athens. It is uh, truly, you know, it's such a great joy to, uh, and by any measure, a true honor to join you this evening. Um, though, although the, the topic of our discussion is, is not a cause for joy, rather it is a cause for grave concern, I would um, uh, say. After, uh, I'm, going, I'm going to comment on two main uh, issues, but let me first say that it has been almost two decades of calm waters in the Aegean between Greece and Turkey, calm waters uh, in Eastern Mediterranean, although you've got the, 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 the usual uh, animosities in, in Cyprus. Uh, but overall, since the, 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 the late 90s, since the emir Kardak crisis, since the, the Ocalan affair, the, there has been um, a, a rather, uh, a rather um, low tension and higher expectations than ever before between Greece and Turkey. You, um, we had a, 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 a very novel institutionalization between the two countries with several uh, visits um, on a regular basis at the highest level, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, however, the order of the day, at least for the last year or so, um, has been um, uh, high tension, uh, high tension in the Greek-Turkish nexus. We are back to what I, what um, is, to the familiar Greek-Turkish tug of war, tug of war which is based on competing historical narratives, but also based on competing geopolitics, revisionist claims, and zero-sum mindsets. This late, latest round of, um, how can I put it, of spirits running high 
is, is about the latter. It's about geopolitics, it's about energy, energy geopolitics, it's about sovereignty claims linked to energy geopolitics, and it's the, 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 the recurring, uh, the usual recurring um, uh, Greek Turkey security dilemma. Hence, brinkmanship uh, tactics are employed without hesitation, and the prospect of a deliberate military clash is far from a remote possibility. Let me briefly comment on two topics. One is of a macro-historical nature, if you like, and it's about the perception of Turkey and its current policies in Greece. The second is how Greece, how Athens has, uh, have responded uh, at both a strategic and a tactical level to uh, the Turkish activities of the last 12 months in Eastern Mediterranean and south of Castellorizo. Okay, the first, my first comment on, on the perception. For the majority in, uh, of Greeks, and this is well documented in the re relevant literature, Turkey is a revisionist actor. It's a power that seeks to, to refashion the status quo. It's a state that, uh, that is not satisfied with its regional status and a state that, that in harbors ambitions of, of, of regional hegemony, especially under a Recep Tayyip Erdogan regime. Um, and it is a state that finds the use of military force um, increasingly attractive. The last 12 months, certain Turkish initiatives have reinforced that long-standing perception. First, following the July 2019 elections, um, migrants and refugee crossings in the Aegean suddenly out of the blue sky skyrocketed. Ankara, it seems that Ankara decided to, to let migrant and refugee crossings across the Aegean unchecked. Um, second, in November 2019, Ankara signed with the Tripoli regime uh, in Libya, a demarcation memorandum, which illustrated, uh, according to, to, to the majority of Greeks, illustrated beyond doubt the Turkish position in Eastern Mediterranean. And this is that islands have uh, however, large or small, are not entitled to, uh, to any rights, maritime zone rights, except territorial waters. The third event that um, uh, has added to, to, to the, 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 the perception and the, the security anxiety uh, is the, what, allow me to call it, the Evros crisis which Greece, Greece uh, for those who are not familiar with it, it was an attempt by tens of thousands of, uh, of migrants and refu refugees to cross the land border uh, with the, um, the, the uh, an, an, an event uh, tolerated, if not sponsored by, uh, uh, by Ankara. Um, and this has been interpreted as, as a very bold attempt to, to, to destabilize the country's political, social, and economic landscape at that time. And finally, it's the current, um, the current um, state of affairs in Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, it's the research activities uh, of, uh, uh, in non-delimited uh, areas, uh, the threats uh, of war, and the very, very toxic rhetoric um, uh, that comes out uh, 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 from, uh, from, uh, from Ankara. Now, the Greek response to all this, very briefly, because I'm running out of time, okay? Uh, Athens has, first of all, has refrained from reciprocating in terms of unilateral activities. Also, uh, uh, it seems that um, that uh, Prime Minister Prime Minister Mitsotakis has issued very strict orders that prohibits anyone in the government or in the party to to respond 
to, to the very high tones, um, uh, high volume that comes out of, um, uh, from Ankara. Second, at a strategic level, Athens has tried to, 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 to rally the troops, so to speak, friends, allies, like-minded states, like-minded as far as Turkey is concerned in the region. So Egypt, Israel, United Arab Emirates, in a much more discreet way, um, uh, Saudi Arabia, of course, friends and, and partners in the uh, European Union, Paris, uh, above all. Uh, Paris has been, you know, uh, France has, uh, has been very willing to, to, uh, to stand uh, uh, by uh, Greece. So it has mobilized support in Europe, Washington, and the Middle East at different levels and with different result, varying results. But, um, but uh, third, it has responded to the Turkish military posturing by demonstrating um, uh, a, a good degree of, uh, of uh, a fairly good degree of operational readiness and, and, and stamina uh, and military stamina. Uh, and that has um, has um, raised the spirits in, uh, in 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 Athens. Fourth, Athens has responded to every uh, escalation move by Turkey with the de jure fair compli. So you've got the delimitation of borders uh, of uh, exclusive economic zone with Italy, uh, and the partial delimitation with. Egypt, which, which more or less, you know, uh, 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 produces a major legal difference uh, between Greece uh, and Turkey over the, that, uh, that uh, area in Eastern Mediterranean, uh, and has announced the extension of territorial waters in the Ionian uh, Sea, uh, and uh, also. Uh, implying that uh, uh, a similar move um, in uh, uh, in Crete uh, will uh, will uh, will follow uh, soon if there is no breakthrough. And finally, uh, it has responded by by declaring uh, its steadfast loyalty to to a structured dialogue, be it. The, uh, the exploratory talks, which is a very attractive forum and, con and, and framework for, for Athens. Uh, but so far, there has been no, uh, no response for Turkey for obvious uh, reasons. I'm going to leave it here and I can come back if there is any question from uh, the audience. Thank you very much, Spiros. I hope I'm, I didn't overdo it. Costa, thank you very much. No, you didn't overdo it at all. In fact, you could have taken a bit more time, but I'll give you a bit more time later on in Q&A to uh, expand. Uh, over now to, uh, to Fiona Mullen, who I think is going to say a few more things about the specific uh, implications of the hydrocarbon energy reserves which have been found in the region. Fiona, over to you. Thank you. So um, last week, I in, at another event, I spoke a bit more about the geopolitics of the East Med and how we uh, how we get to a win-win. But today I wanted to focus a bit more about on um, on the economic side, and that's why I call it a reality check, as you'll see in a moment. Um, so I'm going to look first of all at the global gas market context, then how big are the East Med gas finds compared with everywhere else. Um, and then share with you the results of a model that I update every now and again, at what price is the, is the gas actually viable? And then very short one or two slides on recommendations to policymakers in the context of all of this. So what's the global gas market? Um, certainly at the EU level, it's not really growing. Um, okay, it was up a bit in, um, in 2019, but the, the general trend is at best stagnation, if not um, decline in the EU. And of course, we know that uh, the EU is now committed to, to much more carbon reduction than before. 
Um, China is where the is where the demand is at, but China is a very very long way from the East Med, and it costs a lot of money to send LNG in that direction. And the general pressure on gas prices is downward. You can see uh, the black line here is the Dutch day ahead price. The only reason it spiked in late summer is because of um, because of a strike in Norway. But it's what you can also see is that prices are very volatile. So, so even making an investment decision. So on the one hand, you think if prices are low, that's good for consumers. But if you're a producer, the volatility of prices makes it very difficult to make investment decisions, especially when the price is low and volatile. Um, and why have prices been low is that in 2008, in fact, 2017, 18 and 19, um, there was more gas in the market than there was supply. So obviously that had an impact on prices. It might be stabling out now, but because of COVID and so on, we don't know. And the other remarkable thing is that the solar, so we're talking PV solar, not rooftop solar, utility scale, is already the cheapest um, energy at what Lazard calls a levelized cost of energy. So last year, solar PV was just a little bit lower than wind, and both of those have been lower than gas since 2015. Um, also lower than nuclear, which a lot of people tend to say is cheaper. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, whenever I say solar is cheaper, people say, yes, but what about storage? Um, the price of storage is coming down. If you can see this pink line, um, battery storage prices are coming down very fast. And I think technology will, will continue to put downward pressure on those prices. And then uh, batteries are not very green, um, but I think eventually, maybe, maybe not in the next few years, but perhaps in the next decade or so, uh, batteries, they'll, they'll find something which is, isn't, isn't as dirty as batteries. What they're doing at the moment is they're extending the life of batteries so that, um, so that you get more, more bang for your CO2 bucks, so to speak, um, and they are working on re recycling and so on. But um, but at some stage you need you need uh, something cleaner. So it's no surprise that the International Energy Agency, not to be confused with the Energy Information Administration, which are the U.S. people, expects a, a very large rise in renewables. That's the top line there, and they still expect a rise in gas demand, but nowhere near as much as renewables. So how big are the East Med gas finds? Let's have a look. Um, first of all, I want to show you Cyprus because there's a lot of misunderstanding about what has and hasn't been discovered. So Aphrodite, it's, uh, the drilling company was Noble now, just taken over by Chevron. We're, we're at the stage of what's called recoverable. Um, still not proven reserves unless somebody can uh, correct me on that and it's estimated four trillion cubic feet which is not huge. Exxon um, has found five to eight trillion cubic feet but that's gas in place that's the stage before um, you do appraisal wells and so on so the estimated recoverable could be about 30% uh, less uh, or, or even more than that uh, 30 to 60 percent less. And the important thing is the ENI, although everybody went around saying it was six to eight trillion cubic feet for Calypso in block um, six for ENI, there's actually nothing official. When you really look into what has ENI said, um, they never came out with a number. It was the press that came out with a number. And the rumors, so the high rumors are six to eight, the low rumors are uh, 2.5 to three. So my sort of generous estimate for how much Cyprus has is about 9 trillion cubic feet or 255 billion cubic meters. So how does that compare with the rest of the world? Um, it's pretty small. Russia is the biggest. So, so all of these, apart from Israel and Cyprus, are proven reserves from the BP Statistical Review of World Energy. They update this every year. 
So Russia is enormous. They have 30, 38,000 billion cubic meters, then Iran, then Qatar, then Turkmenistan, then the US, and even Egypt. This might be higher once, once you get appraisal wells and so on, but even Egypt's not very large. Israel, BP says they have 500, but um, apparently it's more than that. It's really more than 1,000. And Cyprus, not even proven yet, maybe around 255. And how does that compare with EU demands? So Russia has, Russia could demand, Russia could by itself supply the EU for 80 years with all of its gas, you know, if it were the sole supplier. If Israel and Cyprus were the sole suppliers, they'd only manage it for, uh, they'd, they'd manage it for under three years. Um, <clears throat> and why, why did I leave out Egypt? Because Egypt is gobbling, uh, is likely to gobble its own supply. They use their, they are um, using absorb faster than normal and so on. So, so there might not be an export market from Egypt. So why is anyone even interested in the East Med? I think it's because of this slide where we see that the UK and the Netherlands are essentially, you know, their old fields are coming to the end of their lives. So maybe at the margins, and I stress at the margins, there might be a market for, for East Med gas. This, but again, I stress it's at the margins. Ru Russia still supplies 33% um, of all gas consumed in the EU. It supplies 40% of the imports. Um, and a little bit more for LNG. The US is now, um, has now beaten Russia for LNG. And there's another competitor for East Med gas. US gas is very cheap. So at what price would East Med gas be viable? Um, now this is a, a model that drives me bananas every time I do it, but um, because the variables change. But uh, to, just to give an idea, I throw in the cost of exploration, production, the cost of pipelines, transport in the case of LNG, um, what the likely finance cost is going to be, what, does, what impact does that have on net present values, and what impact does that have on companies' internal rate of return, and what kind of return would they expect these things? And so if you look at, and I, I focused on Cyprus only because these are the, the these are the, uh, the projects that are sort of live and spoken about is the third one, is sending Aphrodite gas to, to the IDCU LNG plant in, in, um, in Egypt. Um, you need a price much higher than today. Today's price is only 4.28%. You need a uh, price of seven per mm BTU if it's going to be viable for the companies. And the reason I didn't add Israel to that is it looks like they're going to be sending gas to, I think they might even have already started sending gas to Egypt their own way. And then the infamous Eastmed East Med gas pipeline, you're going to need a lot more gas to make it viable at all. And you need a a price of about nine dollars. So last year the average price was around 4.28. So we're very far from viability at current prices, which you know begs the question: Why? Um, why is everyone making such a fuss? Uh, people have often said it's not really about gas; it's about sovereignty and so on. But um, just to finish with a couple of slides on: Given this, you know, it's not really viable at the moment how might we make it viable? And I think the answer is you broaden the East Med market beyond gas. Um, you think about gas and renewables and electricity interconnectors. Maybe you think about green hydrogen, maybe there's communications technology, um, potentially also defense, I suppose. But to get the politicians, and here I would include Turkey, to, to get interested in a broader grand energy deal for the East Med that includes everyone so that nobody's um, uh, threatening each other. I think you need to help the politicians understand what might be possible. And I, I am not expert enough to know that, but there are plenty of institutes that probably should be able to flesh out some of the possibilities. 
You also need low cost finance that ought to be fairly easy if you include the green because everybody wants to invest in green, the sovereign wealth funds, the private equity funds, and of course the European Investment Bank and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. But like I say, I think you know, we'll only get this out of the ground if it's part of a grander energy deal that involves all the countries in the region. So my recommendation is my last slide to policymakers is um, understand that ESMED gas is, isn't viable by itself. Um, help, and this is where I'm talking to the EU really, help the politicians build a vision for a broader energy mix, facilitate the finance that will make that happen, and then I think you'll see that the political deals will follow. So just ending with a shameless plug for my uh, monthly analysis where I cover everything from Cyprus problem, economy to gas. Thank you very much. Fiona, thank you very much for a fascinating and comprehensive um, resume of the, I think, the energy related aspect of this, but I'm sure we'll come back to the sovereignty related aspect of this, which seems to be equally important. James, uh, James Colinsey, over to you. Thank you very, very much, Spiros. And, um, you know, to echo the other two, it's wonderful to be on this platform and, and obviously talking about um, the Eastern Mediterranean. I, I think, you know, what I find particularly interesting in this is that um, we're here talking about Greek-Turkish relations and Cyprus in this sort of sense of an integrated Eastern Mediterranean. And this is something that, um, I actually find sort of quite strange um, to, to, to be working in this way because, uh, you know, I've worked on bilateral Greek-Turkish relations um, and, and have done a lot of work on that. And, and I thought Costa made an incredibly important point that, you know, what we're seeing at the moment uh, is very, very different from, from what we've seen over the past 20 years. And, you know, I, I first really became interested in, in, in direct bilateral Greek-Turkish relations in 1999. I was working on a project uh, to do with Greek-Turkish relations, and it was, it was an incredible year um, to, to, to be looking at it. Um, but I really spent most of my career working on Cyprus. And um, although there tends to be this belief that the Cyprus issue and Greek-Turkish relations are intrinsically and inherently interlinked, um, that actually hasn't been the case um, traditionally. They've been rather separate from one another. Um, now, that's not to say that they have had no relationship, because obviously that's not the case. Um, but it's tended to be that Cyprus has in many ways set the mood music, if you like, um, for bilateral Greek-Turkish relations. Not entirely. Again, we saw in 1999 uh, a period of Greek-Turkish relations of an incredible improvement, which even continued and managed to weather the storm of the 2004 Cyprus settlement efforts where uh, the, the infamous to many people Anan plan was, was presented and rejected by, by Greek Cypriots in a, in a referendum. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the two issues have tended to stand apart from each other. Um, we know what, what the basis of the Cyprus problem is, whereas in the case of Greek-Turkish relations, um, I've always liked to try and characterize this as something that um, is essentially based on transformation of international law. Uh, so Greece and Turkey had worked out their boundaries a century ago at the time of the Treaty of Lausanne. It all looked fine, it was all good. And then what we've seen is a number of um, developments on the international stage over the past century, which has now sort of opened up all sorts of important questions. But what Fiona was talking about, I think is the, the, the missing piece, which is what it's doing is bringing these two issues very close together. And that is this question of uh, energy exploration and the question of um, now the issues of exclusive economic zones uh, and uh, related issues of territorial waters are starting to become very, very important. And I'm, what I'm finding very interesting is the interlinkage that we're now starting to see uh, on these issues. And, and even actually, until relatively recently, when we would talk about these Mediterranean and, and tensions between Greece and Turkey, it was actually fairly narrowly limited to the Aegean. Uh, so when it was talking about uh, energy exploration, we were always thinking about that energy exploration in the East and the Aegean. Uh, and so there would be the tensions that we'd, we'd, we'd see developing there. 
Um, but of course, what we've seen now is that we're now starting to get these energy exploration tensions emerging around the waters around Cyprus and the competing claims uh, that have been made. And I, I think it's important to put on record that, of, of course, you know, the position of, of, of the international community um, is that, you know, these the, the waters around Cyprus are Cypriot uh, recognized waters. I think that that's important to have, you know, make it very clear and it's it's not ambiguous. So obviously, there would be people who would say, look, you know, but you've got to bear in mind there's a political context, uh, you know, that also needs to be brought in mind. Um, but what we're really now starting to see is the latest tensions in that gap between Cyprus on the one hand and the Aegean on the other. Um, and this sort of sense that we're now getting in Turkey uh, of uh, the Greek ec exclusive economic zone buttressing the Cypriot one. And what that means in the Eastern, Eastern Mediterranean. And so for those of us who are looking at these issues and trying to make sense of, of where all this goes, um, this is a much greater complicating factor um, that I think is going to need to be thought about by a lot of the internationals who are looking at the current issues in, in the Eastern Mediterranean and perhaps sort of thinking about how we get, you know, renewed Cyprus talks, but also the question of how can we try and um, create a framework for Greece and Turkey to be able to talk productively and constructively about these issues in, in, in the Aegean. But also now we've got this complicating factor of the Eastern Mediterranean, that gap between Cyprus and, and Greece uh, and their waters, and how those are going to be linked in any discussions. And, you know, I, I, I get the sense that, you know, we do talk about a very unpredictable Turkey at the moment, um, but this will be a Turkey that will also be thinking about um, its strategy for dealing with these issues. Um, and one wonders whether what we're going to now start seeing is a much greater linkage between the Cyprus problem and bilateral Greek-Turkish issues than we've tended to see in the past. The, in actual fact, what we might now start to see is Turkey sort of saying, well, look, you know, if we're going to approach the Cyprus issue, uh, and, you know, obviously that is a whole big question in itself, especially given the results of the Turkish Cypriot elections at the weekend and the, the, the election of, uh, you know, a, a new leader who um, is generally regarded uh, as, as, as a hardliner. Um, as Turkey's thinking about this, are we now going to start to see um, if talks get underway that this relationship with Greece is going to be brought in as well, that now you're going to start getting some bargaining that Turkey could be saying, well, look, we're willing to do this in Cyprus, but we want this uh, in the Aegean or we want this in the Eastern Mediterranean. And these are going to have to be ways that Athens and, um, Athens and Nicosia are going to have to communicate with each other and talk about this and, and, and start thinking that this is now a real possibility. And now for a lot of people that would seem, well, what's the difficulty? Nicosia and Athens obviously talk with each other. They've got a close relationship, but it's not as simple uh, for those of us who, who, who've been looking at the region for a long time uh, as to say that Athens and Nicosia are completely on the same sheet. These are two different countries. They've got an extremely close relationship, a special relationship, one of the most special relationships you can think of, but nevertheless, um, you're dealing with two different countries with their own issues, um, which have actually been rather separate from each other. And so I think this, from my perspective, um, is the area that I'm finding really interesting in what we're seeing at the moment and, and how this is going to interlink and how this creates uh, a new set of dynamics in the Eastern Mediterranean that perhaps we haven't really thought in a lot of detail up till now. Thanks. Thank you very much, James. Uh, it gives me great pleasure now to welcome uh, Professor Yanis Rigoriadis. We've overcome our technical difficulties and he's managed to join us just in time uh, to be able to uh, give his presentation and then we can move on to the question and answer session. Uh, Yanni, over to you. Hello, and uh, I would like first to thank you very much, uh, Spiro and the Hellenic Observatory team for giving me the opportunity to participate in this very interesting event. I will be sharing uh, some conclusions from a paper I authored on a topic which is very similar to the topic of the webinar, which is what went uh, wrong in the Eastern Mediterranean this summer and we have this escalation of uh, in Greek Turkish relations and beyond them. And I will be arguing 
that there are a number of very important uh, issues that we need to consider together in order to understand uh, the, the situation in a better sense. So I'm referring to, of course, the lack of resolution in the Cyprus question as one important parameter and the spillover that the Cyprus issue is causing on Greek-Turkish relations. This is something that uh, I think uh, uh, we have kind of uh, underestimated for many years. We could, we could think that the Cyprus problem and Greek-Turkish relations can develop their own path regardless of each other. But if we look into the history of Greek-Turkish relations, we can definitely see that this is uh, not the case. So I will be sharing some uh, slides to make this point uh, stronger. Uh, another important parameter, of course, is energy and the whole discussion about uh, the East Met gas monetization. As I'm sure uh, Fiona has mentioned, uh, the issue is uh, the, the case, the economic case of this issue is not as strong as many would think, but of course there is a political debate about this and this is linked to sovereignty uh, considerations on all sides. So the energy issue has raised tension. And uh, again, uh, the Cyprus-Turkey con conflict has spilled over to the Greek-Turkish relations and the discussion on uh, Castellorizo and the discussion on the Libyan-Turkish uh, memorandum of understanding is very indicative of that. I think that there are two other issues that are more related to Turkish politics and less to Greek uh, or Cypriot politics. And this is, of course, the increased interest that Libya, uh, Turkey has developed in Libya and the Libyan civil war. This is something that has uh, attracted a lot of international attention. Uh, Turkey has been increasingly behaving in a very assertive way in a number of bilateral uh, conflicts around those civil wars. So it was first Syria, then uh, involvement in Iraq. Of course, Libya was a particular case because not only because Libya was considered to be uh, uh, one of the late, uh, the last Ottoman African territory. That was the last territory that Tur uh, the Ottoman Empire had to see to Italy just before the Balkan Wars, but because Turkey was heavily invested in Libya. So there were a lot of companies operating there in the Gaddafi era. So uh, recouping their investments or making uh, sure that Turkey would be present there was critical. Of course, then, uh, the civil war started and the Muslim Brotherhood connection came to the fore. And of course, uh, if Turkey wants to be present in Libya, developing a maritime bridge to Libya makes even better sense. So in a sense, uh, justifying Turkey's increased involvement in Libya can be stronger if Turkey claims that this Eastern Mediterranean uh, sea between uh, Turkey and Libya is not doesn't belong to Greece or Cyprus, but belongs to the two countries. So these, of course, allowed, in my view, the recovery, the renaissance of a view of Greek-Turkish relations, which was very polemical, but dated back to the 1980s and 90s. And it was based on a number of uh, admirals and military officers who really uh, went against the international uh, law of the treaty convention. So the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, the UNCLOS, which was signed in the early 80s. It was ratified in the early 90s. And uh, they saw in UNCLOS the fear that uh, many Turkish nationalists and Turkish sort of bureaucrats were having in the 50s and 60s and 70s, particularly in the context of the Cyprus issue. And I refer, of course, to the encirclement of Turkey. So. Whether this is realistic or not, uh, it's another matter of discussion. We can have this discussion here, but the Turkish public opinion has appeared to be buying this scenario and this narrative that Turkey should not be allowed to be encircled by its enemies in the region. And in that respect, uh, I could uh, refer to, for example, the East Meth project. I have a, a slide I found uh, recently that one of the possible solutions to the monetization of the is the Mediterranean natural gas that uh, plan to build a pipeline connecting uh, Cyprus, Israel, uh, finds possibly Egypt, Egyptian uh, natural gas uh, reserves to Crete first and then to mainland Greece. Of course, the financial basis, the economic basis of this project is, uh, was always very thin. 
and uh, because neither of the countries involved would have the financial capability to build it without uh, uh, private investors. And in addition to that, of course, uh, these uh, projects aim to signify a sort of uh, an emerging uh, partnership or alliance between Greece, Cyprus, and, uh, uh, and Israel. This, of course, was music to the ears of those who in Turkey try to build this encirclement argument that uh, you see Turkey, Cyprus and Greece and Turkey are trying to uh, uh, encircle Turkey. So we need to, to spoil this game. So that, that was a discourse that appeared to be very strong in uh, Turkish policy responses to this. And uh, many statements of uh, President Erdogan. But in addition to that, of course, I would like to argue that the reason this narrative became so strong is also due to uh, the shifts in domestic Turkish politics and relationships between President Erdogan and the Turkish military. Uh, those admirals that were advocating these positions were marginalized uh, in, 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 the, in the 2000s. Some of them even uh, were involved in criminal investigations under the Balios and Ergenekon cases. So they were removed from, the, from active positions and positions of responsibility. But some of them returned following the, the failed coup of, uh, uh, of 15 July. So their return to power also gave them the opportunity to reintroduce this uh, project that you may have heard as the so-called uh, blue homeland map. So I can show you this, uh, the Mavi Vatan, as it's said, which I think I can, yes. So this is a map that you can see. The, the map in principle cancels all the rights of Greek islands east of the median line of the Aegean, arguing as I said in the beginning, this uh, position that uh, islands have no territorial, uh, no continental shelf and exclusive economic zone, only mainlands matter. So the uh, Greek islands and Cyprus in that respect, as well as you can see, should not be given any uh, rights. Of course, this discourse is a very unilateral and very aggressive discourse that is not normally put forward by Turkey when it comes to the Cyprus conflict or to the Greek uh, Turkish conflict. The discourse that Turkey normally produces refers to the rights of Castellorizo and the islets around Castellorizo, which is as like it, it is a, a, a Greek island, which is uh, like where I put my pointer, like about 120 kilometers east of Rhodes. That, according to the, let's say, to the Greek mac maximalist position, would win Greece a very wide maritime zone in the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, uh, this is considered to be unfair, unacceptable from the Turkish point of view. So uh, I have a map here that would show you how much Castellorizos effect on this Mediterranean uh, zone, uh, like exclusive economic zone would be if it were given full effect. Of course, we do know that uh, similar cases in the International Court of Justice have been treated in various ways. So it's not certain that the International Court of Justice will decide uh, on the case of Castellorizo with uh, uh, giving full effect on, uh, on its on, uh, giving the island full effect on its exclusive economic zone and continental shelf. So to add to this uh, discussion, when it comes to Cyprus, uh, what Turkey prefers to do is not to argue that we claim that I Cyprus has no exclusive economic zone because it is an island, but there it has the opportunity to claim that is the Turkish Cypriots who are not represented, which is a fair position that uh, the, uh, the representation of Turkish Cypriots in the decision-making of the Republic of Cyprus regarding the monetization of energy resources is non-existent. So this has been an issue that has been time and again brought forward in by communal talks or attempts to develop confidence building measures. And unfortunately, uh, we haven't had a conclusive result. So it hasn't been a case whereby Turkish Cypriots representatives were involved in decisions uh, regarding the monetization of uh, natural gas resources of the Republic of Cyprus. So this is another argument. And of course, this is also linked to the uh, lack of progress in the Cyprus issue. So I'm coming back to my original point that uh, uh, 
that the, the, my original point being that the, the, this, the influence of the Cyprus problem on Greek-Turkish relations has been strong and negative in recent years. But uh, I would like to conclude my presentation because I, don't, I know we don't have a lot of time and we should have discussions by pointing that the Greek uh, government's response to this uh, escalation on the Eastern Mediterranean conflict has been rather uh, unprecedented and proactive. Uh, Greece was a country that had no exclusive economic zone agreements with any of its neighbor countries. It had a continental shelf agreement dating back to the 1970s, but not even this agreement was updated. So uh, within a couple of months, Greece was able to sign an agreement with Italy that confirmed practically the line of the, that uh, the two countries had decided when they drew their continental shelf in, the, in 1977. And most importantly, Greece signed an agreement with Egypt on the partial delimitation of their exclusive economic zones. This became very important. Why? Because this bilateral agreement directly contradicted the agreement between Turkey and Libya. So if you can see here on the map, this AB line is the border between the Turkish and the Libyan exclusive economic zone according to the Greek position, the, according to the Turkish and Libyan position. And uh, the line you see here in blue is the line that Greece and Egypt agreed as the border of the, of the respective exclusive economic zone agreements. So if we look into the details of these agreements, it's important to know that the Greek government showed flexibility that was not shown in previous uh, cases. So uh, the Greek government was willing to accept less than 100% effect of islands on the delineation of exclusive economic zone. So, uh, this was the case, uh, particularly in the Egyptian Greek agreement. So the line is not exactly in the medium uh, distance between uh, Crete and the adjacent islands in Egypt. It's slightly to the north, uh, which showed that the Greek government, in my view, was able to, to, to look into the question of maritime delimitation in a more flexible manner. But what is important here is that the Greek government made sure that the counterpart confirmed their uh, position that we will decide this according to the UNCLOS. So the UNCLOS uh, implementation in the Eastern Mediterranean has been reinforced by the signature of these two agreements. Let me add to this point another very important development that has been very recent. Recently, Albania decided to bring their dispute on the maritime zones uh, to the International Court of Justice. That was a result of a recent visit by the Greek foreign minister to Albania. So in that respect, uh, Greece appears to be willing to resolve these issues, uh, but it's willing to resolve this issue according to the international law and the flexibility that this international law is willing to, uh, to give to the parties involved. So uh, I think that's an optimistic message, although the developments in Turkey are not very optimistic in the short term because domestic political developments have for forced the government to seek uh, increasing public support, not inside the country, but through foreign adventures. But having said that, I think it's important to highlight that uh, international law is implemented by Greece on a number of uh, disputes that were considered to be uh, unsolvable or uh, the inertia was chosen to be the preferred way of doing things. Uh, now we have a different attitude which uh, can provide a window of opportunity. So I'll stop here. So I'll have, I'll give time for discussion and questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Yanni, thank you very much. And thank you to all the panelists for providing uh, great range of opinions and views of the various dimensions of what's going on uh, today in the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean from a variety of perspectives. There are a number of issues which I think uh, we may want to cover in a bit more detail. Uh, these are some things that I have noted uh, listening to your presentations and which come through from the questions that have been posted on the Q&A site uh, on this webinar. Uh, some of them are very specifically to do with uh, the energy dimension. So Fiona, they may be more uh, uh, in your direction in terms of answering. Others, of course, relate to the role of um, <coughs> Cyprus uh, and the role of Cyprus in Greek-Turkish disputes. 
Uh, there is obviously a great interest in uh, the broader regional role of Turkey and, and, and why and how it may be going in a variety of different directions. And of course, there's always the question of a broader strategic dimension to do with uh, perhaps uh, what French interests might be, uh, what the US's withdrawal from the region might indicate, and where, for example, the EU and NATO may come into play. So those are some of the broad things we, we, we may want to cover. Um, let me just take a couple of questions first, which are specifically related to the energy dimension, because I think this is one aspect of the situation which perhaps is less well understood by a number of people. Um, from my point of view, I'd like to suggest simply that the energy dimension uh, being part of the broader political problems in the region is not necessarily new. Uh, we've had this throughout the 1970s in terms of Greek-Turkish relations and the possibility of finding oil and gas reserves underneath the Aegean. It, it wandered into the 1980s as well, and it's become a very important issue again now. And the question I think, um, Fiona especially, but please, the other panelists come in when you want, which is being placed by a number of people in the audience, including Panayotis Stylianos, uh, and Peter Scagliotis, who is an alumnus of Queen Mary University in London, is if, as you suggested in your presentation, Fiona, the gas reserves are marginally viable uh, and they're not necessarily going to make a big dent in the regional or European or even global energy market, what's the fuss? Why are we making such a big deal out of it? Now, the related question by Peter Scagliotis is, uh, is this something, for example, that's very important to Cyprus in terms of its own economy, in terms of the tax revenues that may be generated? And this provides us with an indication why Cyprus may be so concerned. What are the implications for Turkey in the same dimension? Uh, these are just very specific questions, which I think you may be able to answer for us. And anybody else who wants to come in, please do. Um, I think there's a couple of reasons. One is that when this all began, um, gas prices were much higher. And there was a prospect of exporting um, Aphrodite gas, but I think the government here really took, I mean, they took a risk to wait and see what else they had. And while they waited, the gas price started to fall and started to fall and started to fall. So that, that's one issue is, is, um, uh, is, is how the gas market has changed very rapidly in the past few years. And the other is they really believe their own hype. I mean, there was talk of this gas is worth 80 billion and we can, we can sell it to pay off, you know, we, we don't need a Troika program, you know, bailout program because the gas is worth loads of money. And because the media here are, um, let's say, not very critical of what the government feeds them, you didn't get any, any questioning of this. I mean, I, I, when I was questioning this, you know, let's say five to seven years ago on Twitter and stuff like that, I would get attacked as being some, you know, um, Turkophile, you know, Turkophile, et cetera, because I was saying, well, you know, I'm not sure if it's viable. <laughs> so, um, so in a way, events have caught up with, uh, with everyone. On the other hand, when you talk to industry people in gas, they say, look, gas is a very long game. I mean, there have been very, very few wells actually drilled in the Cyprus EEZ. Um, Israel drilled hundreds before it found Leviathan. Uh, same in the North Sea, you know, they nearly gave up um, before they found any. So, so it's not necessarily over, but why is it also, so Turkey must know, because Turkey must know the gas is difficult to commercialize as well. But I think the answer is, is because of renewables. So it, we might be in that last little decade window where where you can even do anything with gas. And that might, among all the other reasons, um, explain why Turkey is making such a big fuss now. So, so I think that's, um, so it's a mixture of um, what's happened since the gas discovery. I mean, the, uh, Aphrodite was discovered in 2011 and um, it's nowhere near being extracted anytime soon. So, so the gas market has changed. People believe their own hype. And, um, and people are in a hurry because renewables will take over. Um, as for the gas revenues, you know, it's kind of a moot question if you can't get it out of the ground. Um, the government has suggested, uh, if I remember correctly, and I forget that I have the answer to this, but on another computer, I think they suggested that it could be worth about 500 million a year 
Um, but you could, working backwards, you could work out that was predicated on a much higher gas price than we have today. It was like, it must have been about nine or ten dollars, whereas today, as I was showing, it's under five. So um, I think other calculations have said, let's say, even if they can guess it out of the ground, maybe it's only 150 million. If it were 500 million, that's that's um, a decent return. You, the total government revenue is about seven to eight billion euros a year, but but it's highly unlikely we're actually going to get get that sort of price. And if we can't get that price, no one's going to get it out of the ground anyway. So it's so yeah, it's round in circles. Thank you very much. Would any of the other panelists like to come in on this question of why the fuss, why the energy resources have become such an important issue today? Yanni? Well, let me add to what Fiona said that from the Turkish point of view, uh, uh, discovering new energy sources has been always an important issue because Turkey is very poor in energy resources as a country with a big deficit. Uh, uh, and dependence on Russia, of course, for its natural gas, which has all sorts of di different political and strategic implications. So the issue was there in the beginning of the discoveries, and I refer to the Aphrodite discovery, there were a lot of discussions and hopes that this discovery could provide an opportunity to build some common interest between the Republic of Cyprus and Turkey, because Turkey itself is a big consumer of natural gas. So the hope then was that gas could actually help uh, restructure the relationship uh, between the Republic of Cyprus and Turkey and provide some uh, very necessary revenue for paying the cost of the Cyprus resolution because uh, the, uh, resolving the Cyprus question would mean uh, some important costs, compensations to all sides and uh, refugees who would prefer not to return to their or would, would not be allowed to return to their original villages or towns, but they would be compensated by the new Republic of Cyprus. So, and of course, they would be a strong economic interest between Turkey and the Republic of Cyprus. So this would be a, a beginning of a, uh, of a better partnership between the two. Unfortunately, uh, the existing framing of the Cyprus question was able to swallow the gas issue. So instead of the gas issue changing the Cyprus question, the Cyprus question changed the, the gas question, and we ended up in all these confrontations about sovereignty and conflict, and eventually Greece was dragged into this uh, in recent months. So I think that's important to note. Okay, thank you very, very much, Yanni. Let me just concentrate a bit more on the role of Cyprus, not necessarily in the narrow area of hydrocarbons, but in the linkage which James made and Yanis made and Kostas alluded to in terms of Greek-Turkish relations, the broader Eastern Mediterranean strategic reason, uh, region. We have at least two questions uh, from the audience, one from uh, Christian Frixo and another from Rafael Dimitriou, who's a student at War University of Warwick, who, and I'm paraphrasing them just to get the discussion moving along in various different ways, who, who suggests that um, the linkage of the Cyprus dispute, if you want, uh, with Greek-Turkish relations uh, is very, very dangerous, not only for Greece and Turkey, but for Cyprus itself and could lead to um, the kind of resolution which many people would not be happy with. And linked to this, of course, some people are suggesting that the recent election in the so-called Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus could lead to further complications in terms of the potential uh, division of the island. Um, uh, James, what do you make of this in light of the fact that you suggested this linkage between Cyprus and Greece and Turkey is a very important part of the, of, of, of the puzzle? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, and, and again, I mean, to return to the point that I was trying to make was that, you know, we know that Greek-Turkish relations and the Cyprus issue have been intimately linked with one another. Uh, in, but as I say, more from uh, setting a political tone, if you like, to the relationships. Um, rather than direct trade-offs. And I think it is this element of trade-offs, um, which I think certainly, and especially if I'm to be very honest, if I were looking at this from Athens, uh, I'd be very nervous about at the moment uh, in, in, in particular. Um, and, and I say that because, you know, it's, you know, Greece has tried to tread a very, a very delicate path uh, in its diplomacy with Turkey, uh, of saying, look, we have our own bilateral issues, or issue, 
I think that's the important point to bear in mind, because, of course, we know that Greece's official position is that there is only one issue in the bilateral relationship with Turkey, and of course that's the continental shelf. Uh, there aren't issues to do with territorial waters, there aren't issues to do with territorial airspace, uh, flight information region, these, these aren't things that Greece considers to be issues, but of course Turkey does consider to be issues. And at the same time, uh, Athens offering that support to Nicosia in the framework of UN talks on a settlement of the Cyprus problem, and the Greek position has been, well, look, whatever we can do to help that in the context of Cyprus. But there haven't been those linkages that have existed in the past. It's never really been you know, put on the table. And, and, and we also have to be clear that, you know, although Greece and Turkey are involved in the Cyprus talks, um, they haven't tended to be particularly directly involved. I mean, what we saw in 2017 um, was the closest direct involvement uh, of, of Greece and Turkey since the Annan plan, of course, discussions 15 years ago, um, where we saw that Greece and Turkey and the United Kingdom, of course, were round the table in Crans Montana talking about the security aspects. Um, but even then, I, the sense was that it was all about Cyprus. What I worry about now and what I, I think that uh, we could be seeing, and I, as I say, I think decision makers in Athens could be very nervous about, and I mean, obviously, it'd be interesting to hear what, what the other panellists think, uh, is that would we be in a situation that if new talks on Cyprus were to start now, uh, the anchor would start to say, right, OK, we'd be willing to trade, as I mentioned, X, Y and Z on Cyprus if you will give us ABC in the Aegean or in the Eastern Mediterranean. And so this is going to, and I, I, I think naturally that creates new potential tensions in that relationship between Nicosia and Athens. I mean, whatever they'll want to say publicly about being in lockstep and, and all the rest of it, this will, if this starts to happen, I, I, think, I think create very, very difficult situation for many decision makers, again, especially in, in Athens, because Cyprus would say, well, look, we're not having to, you know, we've got the Cyprus problem, we've got to get that sorted. And the negotiations have always been on what can the two communities negotiate in terms of governance and things like that. But this now introduces a thing, what could Greece be asked to put on the table? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, James. Costa, would you like to come in at this point? Yeah, uh, just let me let me uh, uh, repeat uh, for the for the sake of of, uh, of our audience um, uh, very briefly what is the 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 um, uh, the history of uh, of um, Cy the Cyprus problem in relation to Greek Turkish relations. There was a strategic decision both in Nicosia and in Athens to decouple them. Okay, so Greek Turkish relations, bilateral, in the microcosm of the Aegean, the issues or the issue, very specific. Uh, and, and Cyprus, an international problem to be resolved, to be negotiated and hopefully resolved under the auspices of the United Nations. Okay, and this is, this is, it, it has, it, there, there is a historical background there. The, the, the burden of Athens in the 60s and during the junta, uh, getting involved and in trying to dictate uh, the, the uh, uh, policies in Cyprus and the, uh, the final settlement between Greece and Turkey. So this bilateralization of the issue is, is, is burdened with, with, uh, with, uh, with the history and the strategic outlook of Athens, uh, of, of the Greek policies and the Greek Cypriot policies was that decoupling is what uh, 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 is the basis of, uh, of uh, our approach. Um, uh, because essentially Cyprus is a problem of, of uh, invasion and occupation by uh, uh, illegal invasion and occupation by a foreign country. So energy and above all the regional ambitions, the regional designs by Ankara since the, the, the late 2000s uh, following the Arab Spring, I think this is what that, this is what brought in a, in a geostrategic sense 
Cyprus and uh, the Aegean together. Energy, the energy findings uh, reinforced that trend, but it was the, 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 the very activist uh, uh, regional Turkish foreign policy that uh, by default brought the two uh, uh, together. And now it is extremely hard to, to decouple it. And um, this, although I agree with James that Athens has never uh, had a, a serious leverage over Nicosia, uh, but nevertheless, during the, the, the last uh, attempt, the Crown Montana attempt to resolve uh, the, the Cyprus problem, a Athens, after many decades, appeared to be playing um, appeared to be a veto player. It was Athens essentially that, uh, that uh, according to my reading anyway, that, uh, uh, that, that forced the negotiate, the, the, that, that made the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the resolution, the agreement, the settlement of the security and guarantee issues a deal breaker. I'm not sure if, um, uh, if that would have been the case had Athens been more, more offhand as uh, it used to be. Uh, and again, this, uh, uh, again, according to, to uh, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a paper about this anyway. So it, it was um, a certain foreign minister that had the ambition, that, had the, 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 uh, that wanted to set the context for uh, for this kind. Um, so I think this is, and then let me say a few words about, or just one word about the, the recent election in the Turkish um, uh, Cypriot um, uh, community. Uh, if uh, if uh, Ersin Tatar, the new president, is true to his words, then uh, the, the framework uh, uh, within which the Turkish Cypriots would be willing to negotiate would be a very loose confederate format, essentially a two-state solution. Is there any room for bargaining? Is there anything for the Greek Cypriots in this kind of, 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 um, uh, of prospect? Is there something that would make uh, uh, attractive or uh, I don't know, I don't know, but I'm pretty certain that there is, as we speak, a very serious revisiting the Greek Cypriot strategy uh, as, as in the expectation of a new initiative by the Secretary General. Thanks, Kostas. Uh, Fiona, please. Yeah, I... Um... I just wanted to emphasize James's point. I think Greece has already, it just reminded me what, what James said. Um, it must have been two or three months ago when uh, Foreign Minister Dendias of Greece was asked about, he was asked some sort of question about Cyprus and he said, I'm sure they can look after themselves. And that was greeted in Cyprus with consternation because I think they felt, oh, does that mean, um, does that mean Greece is abandoning us? So that's a very um, key worry here in Nicosia. Um, but it also, I think, showed that Greece, that Athens is worried about being drawn into Turkey coming and trying to play them off against each other, which I'm sure uh, we all know what a formidable bargain a Turkey is. So um, I, think, I think they would try that on. Um, just a quick note about the Turkish Cypriot elections. So Tatar is from a party which is traditionally nationalist. I, I think personally he's just an opportunist. Whether that makes any difference, I don't know. Um, I mean, I met him personally when he was just an accountant, as it were. Um, but he's not of that sort of long UBP party vein. It might not make any difference. I mean, people would have said that about certain other leaders in the world, though they're not a real racist, but then they end up... <laughs> Currying the vote of racists and so on. So, um, so it might make, uh, but I, but I do think it's changed what's possible. 
uh, and a confederation is incredibly difficult because you're, it's a eurozone country. Could you have half inside the euro and half outside? And if you don't, how on earth do you decentralize in a country where there's such a lot of um, single direction? You know, the, 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 the pressure is for single management of fiscal policy. And I don't know how you would do it in a federation, in a confederation. Okay, thank you very much. I have got at least three different sets of questions that I'd like to put to the panel representing a number of people's concerns as appearing on the Q&A page. Uh, the first is related to Turkey, so perhaps uh, Yanis would like to take mm -hmm. the first stab because it relates to the Blue Homeland idea. Mm -hmm. And there's two people who are asking very specifically about Mavi Vatan Blue Homeland. The first question comes from John Kitmer, independent researcher, who says, in the panels who asks, in the panel's view, is the concept of Maviotan a serious long-term Turkish strategy? Is it military? Is it sovereignty or energy that's at stake? Uh, is it an attempt to push Greece into missteps? What are Erdogan's short-term and long-term objectives? Uh, and related to this, we have a question from Konstantin Buhaya, who's a writer and broadcaster on Greece and Cyprus, who's essentially asking the same question, but putting it in a much more uh, a, a provocative way. He mm -hmm. says uh, that the Turkish position on Blue Homeland can be uh, summarized in a single tweet. Turkey is defending its Mavi Vata, Blue Homeland. Castellorizo is 580 kilometers away from Greece, only 1.2 kilometers from Turkey. Gray zones, continental shelf. Turkey absorbs refugees. Doesn't this powerful but oversimplified line indicate that Ankara sees only a military solution where snappy bullet points prevail? So the question is, uh, how much of a strategy is this? Is this short term? Is this long term? Is this opportunistic? Does it inevitably end up in a military confrontation? Yanni. Yes. Uh, well, uh, this uh, blue homeland vision or doctrine, you name it, however you prefer, has been on the table for some years. It's not a recent discovery. What is recent is the decision of the Turkish president to uh, adopt it and introduce it into this uh, multifaceted Turkish foreign policy. So uh, my argument is that uh, his increasing involvement in a number of regional disputes, and I refer to Libya, to Syria, you can like Armenia, Azerbaijan, or uh, in other parts of the world, even in the Sahel, like in Africa, Turkey is getting increasingly involved, is fueled by this uh, uh, new vision that has been uh, introduced by Ahmed Dautoglu and later was sort of uh, adopted by President Erdogan. And it's also supported by the disintegration of what we call international community and the decreasing role of the United States in the region. So. Turkey may be feeling that there is a vacuum there that they can fill, but the capacity of Turkey to deliver what is promised in all these fronts, in my view, is very questionable. And this policy is likely to either put Turkey into many risks, or it may be abandoned when this is not going to be necessary on the domestic front. And as I try to explain, in, in my view, the Turkish government is trying to move the public's attention from the domestic audience, the state of the economy, the state of the, inter the societal relations in Turkey have never been worse in the last, uh, for, for a couple of, uh, since the beginning of the AKP administration. So in that respect, uh, Erdogan will be using this as an instrument as long as he finds it fit. But he may decide to give it up when he finds another emergency or he may find another opportunity to continue uh, his struggle to remain the hegemon of Turkish politics. So uh, to give you an example of that, a few months ago, uh, I think in May, Jihad Yaeju, who is one of the admirals that has been considered to be a leading figure of this Mavi uh, vision, he was removed from his position because he came into a confrontation with Hulusi Akar, the Minister of Defense. So this is not that they, they are sort of super influential and powerful within the Turkish, uh, the, the existing Turkish political and military establishment. They are present, they have their influence. They may create some uh, like irreparable damage to Greek-Turkish relations. For example, the Turkey-Libyan Memorandum of Understanding is here to stay for some time at least. It is going to be an issue in bilateral Greek-Turkish relations, but I don't think that this is 
a sort of, from Erdogan's point of view, a long-term strategy that is going to be followed at any cost and under any circumstances. If I may add uh, a couple of points on the previous question on uh, Turkey, on Greek Cypriots and, uh, and uh, Greece and the way Turkey looks into this relationship. I think one of the most interesting uh, misperceptions of Turkey on the Cyprus issue and on the Greek-Turkish relations is that they, think they tend to project the relationship between Turkey and North Cyprus on the relationship between Athens and uh, Nicosia. So they assume that Greece has a stronger influence on the decisions of the Republic of Cyprus. And sometimes they even come to the point of blaming Athens for what Nicosia does. And this is something that people in Athens have not been uh, always aware about. And this has led to a lot of kind of, let's say, misunderstandings in the bilateral relationship, which uh, is uh, important and needs to be highlighted because so far Athens has been, uh, let's say, more comfortably following uh, what Nicosia has been doing and has been planning on the Cyprus issue. But when, as we discussed before, there is a threat of spillover from the Cyprus problem to Greek Turkish relations, then they realize that this policy might not be the best way to protect Greek interests, especially in the bilateral relationship. Finally, because we talked about the elections in the north of Cyprus, I would agree that uh, this is a development that would make uh, the prospect of a solution on the bi-zonal, bi-communal federation much more difficult. Uh, and this reflects some long-term changes in the, Greek, in the Turkish Cypriot uh, society as well. We, and we shouldn't forget the number of people who are naturalized every, every four years. The, the, the number of Turkish Cypriot voters is quite substantially higher. And most of them are actually people who move from Turkey to, their, to the north of Cyprus and they eventually acquire voting rights. But uh, if we really think though, then that's, I would agree with Fiona on that, that Turkey is so influential on what Turkish Cypriots do so the difference between Akhen Tatar may not be as important when it comes to decisions. So in a sense, Tatar may still do what Ankara wants him to do. And uh, this is something that uh, we will have to explore in the near future when the UN Gen Secretary General makes a new initiative or makes a comment about how to proceed with the Cyprus problem and uh, within which framework. Thank you. Thank you, Yang. James, would you like to come in at this point? Or Kostas, do you have anything to add? Yes. Kostas. Very briefly about the, the Blue Homeland vision or doctrine um, or narrative. Um, my, the, the problem, I, I, I tend to agree with, uh, with uh, Yanis. Uh, the, the, the problem, though, is that the, ray, the, 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 the stakes are so high. In uh, in uh, in Turkey's public discourse, uh, you know, you you've seen all these ministers, um, uh, you know, moving around, holding all these maps, and you, when you show the map, you say, "Look at the map." And w w is there any problem? Is there any impediment towards realizing the blue, the Mavi Vatan um, uh, uh, vision? It's Greece and Cyprus. There's no other, other, you know, obstacle towards the, 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 the strategic realization of this. And this is, this is, this is extremely hard because uh, no Turkish president, no Turkish regime can, be, can, can appear to be of, um, uh, you know, um, um, backtracking uh, 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 on the face of, 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 uh, of Cypriots or... or Greeks, uh, okay. So for me, I'm not so sure that he can he can easily reject Erdogan can easily sort of uh, 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 find something else. Uh, uh, so, and, and and one more comment about the 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 recent or not so recent Turkish appetite for uh, involvement and this overextension and the implications that all this might have on, on Turkey in the years to come. Um, uh, the, the thing is that the, the Turkish military involvement in, uh, in, uh, in Iraq or in, uh, in Syria or in Libya or now in, uh, um, uh, 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 in uh, the Caucasus uh, region 
it is very it, it, um, it is very how can I put it um, it's very conscious of losses so it is a very um, uh, uh, well calculated and well planned entanglements with mercenaries in most of the cases uh, not getting dragged into major battles uh, and this at least in the medium term uh, uh, run can make this strategy viable and sustainable that's what i wanted to Gostas, thank you very much. Could I just broaden the discussion out a bit? Before I do so, there are, uh, uh, there are uh, two people who have suggested that um, uh, we don't have enough uh, Turkish or Turkish Cypriot representation on the panel. One of the particip participants, Charles Ramsden, affiliation unknown, uh, has suggested that we should take into account that uh, notwithstanding Greek and Greek Cypriot rights, Turkey and Turkish Cypriots have legal rights in the area too. What does the panel think of that? And I will ask you to uh, answer that in the context of, of, of the next uh, few minutes. But let me just put a broader question uh, to all of the panelists because we are rapidly running out of time. There is a broader strategic context here and we have uh, at least three people who are, who are asking um, uh, about the, uh, the role of the US and the role of France, for example, as external actors here in the Eastern Mediterranean. Alexander Zachariadis, who's a PhD student at the LSE, and Paul Kidner, who's an LSE alumnus, are asking essentially about the role or non-role of the US uh, in this current crisis, and what does it mean that the US is perhaps withdrawn from the area, and what does this do to the relationship between uh, Greece and Turkey? A second uh, uh, part of this question, second dimension, comes from Ragnar Weiland, who's also an LSE uh, graduate and is now uh, in and is now in Leuven, uh, studying uh, towards a postdoc, uh, who asks about France's role. What is France's interest, and why is it so heavily involved uh, in the situation, both from an energy perspective and from uh, the, the sort of military political contestation which is going on? Uh, James, would you like to have a stab at answering this uh, this particular dimension, this particular question? Yes, and I, I mean, I don't know if you want me on that first point that was brought up. But I mean, I, I think, you know, on, on the question of, of, of Turkish and Turkish ship representation, look, absolutely, uh, it's important to have these sort of debates where you bring in Turkish Cypriots and, and, and Turkish nationals to talk about it. But I've always felt that, you know, and I've, I've encountered this many times, uh, that not everything needs to be looked at in that framework. And I, I think, you know, it's important also to have these discussions about how the different actors interact with each other, um, which doesn't necessarily always have to be put in the context of here we have a Greek Cypriot and here we have a Turkish Cypriot, or here we have someone who's Greek and here we have someone who's Turkish. And um, you know, and I, I think this is this is why this is such an interesting debate in many ways because um, I, I think it's very much framed in that sort of relationship uh, that exists between Cyprus and Greece and how the Cyprus issue and Greek-Turkish relations need to be thought of. Uh, in, in, in that context. So I think that would be my immediate, I don't mean to sort of put words in the mouth of the HO or anything like that. Um, but, you know, I, I, think, I think sometimes there's a tendency to think that everything has got to be done in a bicommunal way. Uh, and uh, of course that isn't the case. I, I think, you know, there's important discussions to be had uh, which don't, aren't framed in that way. Um, in terms of external relations, I mean, you know, I, I've been saying a little bit um, recently that, um, it's incredibly interesting to look at how uh, the geopolitics of the Eastern Mediterranean is today as compared to 20 years ago. So we were talking about, you know, about Greek-Turkish rapprochement, but also remembering that in 1999, uh, Greece and Cyprus had absolutely appalling relations with Israel. Uh, they were they were really really bad. I, I can remember, you know, and, and many of you will know that, you know, I've, I've lived on Cyprus, uh, you know, for many years. I've actually lived in Greece as well. Um, but you know, the, the Greek Cypriots were arresting Israelis uh, and accusing them of being Mossad agents and things like that. And there was a general sort of outpouring of anti-Israeli sentiment. Uh, meanwhile, Nicosia had been playing a strong game with the Arab countries for many years. Uh, in order to get the General Assembly votes on anything that came up against Turkey. Um, and so um, really what, and, and of course at the same time, the relationship between Israel and Turkey uh, couldn't have been closer. 
uh, you know, they were flogging, well, you know, they, they were doing lots of trade between each other and Israeli, you know, Israel was giving Turkey all sorts of defense goodies and things like that. Um, and now to see how that relationship has split, um, I think is incredibly interesting for those of us who've been looking at the region for a long time. Uh, meanwhile, where has the United States been in this and how has the Trump administration responded? And we're seeing a much closer alliance between the United States and, uh, and, and Nicosia than I think we've ever, we've ever really seen in the past. Um, and, and as for France, well, I, <laughs> I tend to be a bit skeptical. Um, about French involvement in all of this, partly because I remember what happened in 2005, which is, um, you know, and I'll, I'll be very honest again, I mean, there was another great love in between Paris and Nicosia. Nicosia was sure that Paris was going to, um, you know, stand by it on, on opening Turkish membership talks and everything like that. And frankly, uh, you know, Paris, we got to a stage where Paris got what it wanted from Turkey and then essentially ordered Nicosia uh, to drop its veto. And I can still remember uh, the horror in Nicosia as it realized it had been played by France. And here we are 15 years later, again, history repeating itself. Uh, so I, you know, and I, I know that it could be a case of he would say that, wouldn't he? Um, but I, I, I'd be arguing that Nicosia should maybe be a little bit more careful than it is about how it, uh, how it deals with France and, and remembering that Paris will have its own very, very specific set of interests. And once it feels those are met, then I'm not so sure that it's going to stand sort of shoulder to shoulder. Um, so I think, you know, Nicosia, maybe to a degree Athens could, could be let down by this at some point. Fiona, would you like to come in on this point? No, okay. Uh, Costa, could you please uh, say something perhaps about a, a power vacuum in the Eastern Mediterranean with the withdrawal of the United States of America, or is this a misrepresentation of what's going on? How does the U.S. affect the region? Well, if, if you look back, and then and uh, you know, the, 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 there was some some uh, uh, some uh, uh, the United States put in place an architecture uh, of triangles in the seventies that made the region not more stable but more able to. To, to withstand uh, crisis uh, uh, erupting in, uh, 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 in an, uh, around Israel or uh, elsewhere in the region, uh, was able to, to, uh, to put the lead on, on the uh, Saudi-Iran uh, 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 strategic uh, 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 competition. So in that sense, what happens since the, uh, uh, I, I would say, since the mess of the uh, uh, Bush administration involvement in uh, Iraq, and then uh, since the, 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 the more or less um, uh, detachment of um, the Obama administration from the uh, regime uh, change in the region first in Egypt, then in Tunisia, then uh, and the the the, uh, the 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 lack of uh, of uh, of appetite to uh, to uh, use its gravitas, its military gravitas, uh, to uh, to contain uh, the Syrian conflict and to uh, to lead the way uh, towards the deposing of uh, the Assad regime then yes, there is a new landscape, a landscape that is uh, a ground that is fertile for regional actors to be much more assertive, uh, for uh, regional actors to compete with each other, for regional actors to try and dictate uh, the terms of, uh, of interaction uh, in, in, in various hotspots in the region according to their own interests. And one of these actors, of course, is, uh, is uh, Turkey. And let me let me again um, uh, uh, note uh, here that it is it is Turkish assertiveness that has transformed by necessity, as a, as a, you know, out of necessity, Greece into a more regional actor than in the past. And now you've got the Greek foreign minister traveling to every corner of the region, 
from the 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 the, the uh, uh, from uh, Pakistan, literally, or from the Pakistani borders, uh, to uh, uh, to um, uh, Western uh, to Western uh, uh, Africa. So everywhere, first of all, trying to contain uh, Turkey, uh, but uh, and building up uh, uh, support. Uh, so. Let me put it that way: the age of innocence for Greek foreign policy is over. The the, the times where Greece could hide behind uh, the European positions on several issues without having any interest in 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 getting involved is is over. And it was Turkey's overextension. It, it was Turkey's regional ambitions that has also transformed Greece into into a much more proactive regional player. Thank you, Costa. Yanni, would you like to say something about the broader strategic picture? And we'll finish after mm -hmm. that. We have run out of time. I would have liked to take another couple of questions, especially one question asked by two LSE uh, affiliated students, Nura Oktem and Narin Ishkanyan, who asked about Nagorno-Karabakh and what implications this has for the region, for Cyprus, etc. But unfortunately, we won't be able to, to deal with that right now. Yanni, you have the final word in terms of mm -hmm. broader strategic picture. Yes. Uh, well, I would like to uh, reply to James's comment on the role of France, which I think tells us a bit about how the Eastern Mediterranean uh, strategic uh, framework may develop in the, in the near future. I do agree that uh, this uh, rapprochement of Greece with Israel and France is more linked to the deteriorating relations of France and Israel with Turkey and less with the success of Greek foreign policy in convincing these two countries that they're better partners than Turkey. So in, in, in the event of uh, a new Turkish foreign policy, a new Turkish administration, we may see a fundamental change in that respect. Having said that, I would like to add though that Turkey, France's problems with Turkey go much further than the Eastern Mediterranean. There are a number of issues and regions where the two countries have been confronting each other, particularly because France considers some of the regions where Turkey has been recently increasingly active as, their, its, as its own spheres of influence. So uh, to give you an example, uh, Tur uh, the visit of the, the Turkish foreign minister to Mali a couple of weeks ago following a coup there was not welcome, of course, in France, because this is an area where France has been considering as uh, an area of its primary strategic uh, influence. And add to that all this Islam, the, the confrontation about Islam and the fact that the President Erdogan wants to raise a civilizational conflict uh, sort of dimension into his domestic rhetoric. So uh, uh, the, the comments by President Macron on the need to reform Islam before and after the uh, a heinous crime against the French teacher were responded by the Turkish president in the sense that, you know, so in that respect, I don't see any uh, reconciliation of Franco-Turkish relations in the near future, particularly to the extent that this becomes a, a, a parameter of domestic uh, Turkish politics. So in that respect, uh, we will have to wait until the American elections and maybe the uh, arrival of a new president, if Biden gets elected in January, to see whether the, a new administration, if there will be one, would be willing to restore some of the American influence in the region. And this is going to give us a completely new strategic map about the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, not, uh, let's not forget that President, uh, uh, as pr Vice President Joe, uh, Joe Biden had an interest in Cyprus. She has, he was personally involved in this, so that this might provide a new window of opportunity in the, on the occasion that he gets selected. And this, of course, would refer to other disputes. So Nagorno-Karabakh could be seen into this. So a more interested, a more assertive American administration would be willing to prevent a conflict and promote uh, a detent and uh, peaceful conflict resolution. Thank you very much, Yanni. I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time to what I think was a really interesting and stimulating panel, which involved a vast number of different dimensions towards a very complex crisis. 
I'd like to thank all of those of you who participated and attended the event. There were over 100 participants, which is a great success, I think, for all of us involved. Uh, thank you all very much for the questions as well. I'm afraid I didn't have time to take all the questions, but uh, we got a fair representation of what was being asked by our audience. Don't forget that this event has been recorded and it will be available as a podcast on the Hellenic Observatory uh, website in due course. And last but not least, I'd really like to thank our four panelists for not only taking the time, uh, but giving us such a great representation of what is at stake and where we may be going from in here in the future. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.